everybody. Uh, welcome back. Good to see you all again. Um, I'm going to show you a video, kind of a tour of how to do the projectile calculations on this first example from our notes. Uh, so we have a pirate ship who fires at an enemy ship, and we know that the cannonball has a velocity of 100 meters per second at 20 degrees above the horizontal. We want to know what could we expect for the cannonball's range. Now, two things we're going to pretend here. One, we pretend there's no air resistance because remember, um, air resistance makes our calculation a lot harder. We're just trying to figure out general uh, patterns here. Uh, two, we're going to pretend that the cannonball lands at the same height. So when it says above the quote unquote horizontal, that's what that means. If you imagine a horizontal line, straight side to side, um, and imagine the cannonball coming out of your cannon. So here's, here's our cannon, right? Our cannonball coming out the end. We're going to imagine a straight line going sideways from that. Okay. Okay. So um, go back to that slide that described the steps. Okay. I'm going to just kind of walk these through. So first thing you want to do is you want to have a picture. Okay. I'm going to label it with X and Y numbers. So I've, I've already copied and pasted my picture. Um, you can just, you know, just draw a quick sketch. It doesn't have to be real fancy. What we do want to have on there, though, is what numbers from the original question would we see in our picture and where would they be located? So it's talking about the cannonball right when it fires. Remember, it was 100 meters per second at 20 degrees. So on here, I've drawn my, I'm just going to select this. I've drawn my cannon firing from my pirate ship and I drawn the trajectory, right? I'm an arc. I've added to this right here. This is that what they call in the question, the horizontal. It's basically just saying, hey, imagine a horizontal line drawn right where the cannon ball comes out of the cannon, straight across. That 20 degrees is from the horizontal lines. So we're talking right there. Right. OK. And then the 100 meters per second, that, remember, is going to be the length of one side of our triangle that we're going to do. And so the question is basically asking if the cannonball were to land right here. Right. How far away is that? What is the range? So range is what we're looking for. Change my color here. The range of the cannonball is our goal. Now notice that is a side to side thing. Okay, it's asking how far away sideways is the cannonball hitting? That's gonna be really important. All right, go back to the notes. Step two says create an X and a Y chart for the question. Okay, I'm gonna do that real quick. I got X numbers. Oh, sorry, I got it on ink to shape. I forgot about that. My apologies. We're just going to undo that. Take that off. I'm going to move this actually. Yeah, just move it up to here. Okay. In fact, I'm going to restart my chart. So X and Y. Because remember, this situation has numbers that are talking about side to side stuff and up and down stuff. And so we need to know which is which. Okay, go back to the notes. Step three find the V1 using Sokotoa for X and for Y. Okay, so what does that mean? Remember, this is like a triangle. We have this is our hypotenuse. And we can make a right triangle out of this thing, okay, where the up and down side is the VY and the side to side side is the VX, okay? So step one, we got done, we drew a picture. Step two, we got a chart started. Now step three is we're gonna find our V1s, okay? So, so Katoa. Excuse me. So we have, I'm going to just fly through this. If you don't remember how to figure out what sides are the opposite and adjacent and how to solve this, remember I have those videos on um, other links and I'll post that at the end of this one as well. So we know sine of 20 degrees equals my VY 
over 100 meters per second. Okay, and if you don't remember why it's the Y, again, go back to those Sokotoa videos. Um, so when I solve for this, I'm going to get 34.2 meters per second. It's actually going to be like a positive. So I'm just going to put that on there. And then cosine of 20 degrees equals Vx over 100 meters per second. And again, if you don't know why the Vx, make sure you go into those videos. And that's going to be 94 meters per second when I solve it. Okay, so that's... The third thing. Now, these numbers right here, I'd like you to do two things. First, put them on your pick. And then secondly, those go on our chart as our V1s. Okay, so my picture here is VY is 34.2, and that's upward. So I'm going to actually make this into kind of an upward uh, triangle. I'll actually add a different color to make it a little easier to see. And then the VX here. That's to the side, to the right specifically, and that is 94. Okay, so we have 94 meters per second to the right, 34.2 meters per second up. Okay, what's next? Well, go back to your notes. Number four, step four says, okay, now go back and I want you to be thinking about what are all the X and the Y numbers that we actually already know, even though the question doesn't tell us about them, okay? So think about, we know acceleration, okay? For both the side to side and the up and down direction. What is the only force pulling things down? Gravity, that's that negative 9.8 number. Gravity, however, does not affect the side to side direction at all. Gravity doesn't push you suddenly sideways. It can only pull you downwards, and so, <clears throat> For the x direction, because we pretend there's no air resistance, no wind or anything like that, then we can actually say there is no force in the side-to-side -side direction. No force means no acceleration. So in the x direction, the side-to-side -side direction, A is going to be zero. So I'm going to actually put those in my chart right away. And I actually forgot to put my V1s in here. So V1 for the x direction is 94 meters per second. V1 for the y direction is the 34.2 meters per second. I'm going to put the little plus there. Plus because it is going upwards, not downwards. Downwards is that negative. And I know for the acceleration now, a, I'm going to say Ax just to remind me that it's a side to side zero meters per second squared. And for the y, a y equals negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, let's go back. What else do we also know? We know numbers at the peak. Okay, the peak is the highest part. We know that the vy is zero. And if you go to this next one down here, vx is the same as v1 everywhere. So let's put those in not only our chart but let's also put those on our picture so the peak is right here right i'm going to put in i know the vx because acceleration is zero and a zero acceleration means your speed doesn't change if the vx was 94 at the beginning the side to side speed is still 94 meters per second and then the vy the up and down speed is zero because it was traveling upwards for an instant in the up direction it stops and then it starts traveling downward it's just like if you throw something straight up in the air it's slowing down slowing down slowing down slowing down stops and then starts speeding up downwards that's why vy is zero at the peak because that's the moment where it stopped going up and now it's falling back down after that okay what else do we know we know the landing spot Okay, one of the cool rules about projectiles is that when things land, we also know things, assuming, and this is the key, that they land at the same height. So Vx, what should Vx be? Well, acceleration is zero, which means Vx is the same everywhere. So it's still 94 meters per second sideways when it lands. The Vy, however, 
is now the same speed when it launched, but it's moving downwards now, which means it's a negative. So instead of being positive 34.2, it's a negative 34.2. I'm going to put those things in. V peak is 94. V landing, again, this is for the X, is 94. For the Y, the velocity of the peak equals zero meters per second. And the velocity for landing equals negative 34.2. And just to remind myself, I'm going to put these in as are these possible V2s that I might need. Because remember, a lot of our equations have V1 and they have V2. And our job is to figure out which equation to use. Okay, so that was part four, filling in our other numbers. Okay, so that's what we just did. Find our other numbers, whether it's acceleration numbers, whether it's numbers at the peak, or numbers for where it lands. Okay, part five. Part five says now look at what you're trying to find, the variable. Is it an X number or is it a Y number? What is range? We already talked about that range is a side to side thing. Okay, so range is side to side, which means in my chart here, I'm looking for something that is a side to side number. Move this over here. Okay, so my X is what I'm going to be using. Range is a distance. So this is actually asking me to find the DX. What is my X distance? Okay, it is an X number, which means when I'm trying to get to my final answer, this is key, trying to get to my final answer, when I'm using an equation that has D in it, if I'm trying to find a DX, all of my numbers must be coming from the X column. Okay, and that's key. So I have a couple of equations on my equation sheet. A lot of times it's going to come down to this equation. In fact, this equation actually incorporates a lot of equations put together. V1 times T plus one half times A times t squared. That's a squared, not a t2. Okay, so looking at that, what piece is missing? Time. And that's oftentimes the case is time is missing. So if you go back to the notes, a lot of times the very last step is to pick a side to calculate time. Now, interesting thing about time Time doesn't have a direction. So if you can calculate the time on either the X or the Y numbers, that's the same time on both sides. Because however long the cannonball takes to fly through the air is however long it takes to fly through the air. And so we pick a side on a chart that gives us enough numbers to find time. Now, you might be looking at this and say, oh, we might be able to find um, time using this equation using just the x numbers because I have it. Or I'm looking for a d. Um, wait a second. I don't have a d. That means I can't use that for the x. And you might be saying, okay, well, what if I use these as a v2? We have that equation way back when where we have. Um, actually, two of them. We have acceleration equals v2 minus oops, v2 minus v1 over t. I can solve for time. I have an a, I have a v2, and I have a v1. Or we have v2, <coughs> excuse me, equals the negative. I'm sorry, v1 plus a times t. Well, here's the problem if you're using the x numbers. What's our number for a? Zero, which means when you plug zero in here, it's not going to work because zero times t, when you're rearranging to find t, you're not going to be able to find t. And if we plug in t 
t or a for zero here, this whole point here would just cancel out to zero and it wouldn't help us to find t. So we can't use these numbers for x. What we can do though is we can look at the y side of our chart. We have a v1, we have an a, and we have a v2. We, in fact, we have two of them. So now we just say, okay, which of those V2s would work for us? We're trying to find when the cannonball lands. So let's use the velocity in the Y direction of when it lands. So this one right here. Okay, so um, it doesn't really matter which of these you use. I'm going to find time. This is like step 5B. So we know acceleration is a negative 9.8. And I know my V2 and my V1. V2, be careful here, V2 is a negative 34.2. And my V1 is a positive 34.2. Be careful, those don't cancel out to give you zero because one was negative and one was positive. This is the whole reason we need to do the negatives and positives. All over T. So I'm using this equation right here. Okay, so I'm going to go through, I'm going to rearrange, and when I rearrange to get t by itself, I multiply both sides by t, and then I'm going to have to divide by the negative 9.8. So t equals, I'm going to actually do that number on top. I have a, I've got my calculator. Again, I got negative 34.2 minus 34.2. That gives me, oops. I got something else in there, sorry. Negative 34.2 minus 34.2. It gives me a negative 68.4 all over my negative 9.8. Okay, so now I simplify that. Negative 68.4 divided by my negative 9.8. And I get suddenly now a positive number because my uh, negatives would cancel out. I get 6.98 seconds. Okay. Now, be careful. That's not your final answer. That's your time. Time is 6.98 seconds. Well, what's beautiful about time is we can also put that over here because time does not have a direction. The time on both sides is going to be 6.98 because it's just telling you how long does the cannonball fly through the air? 6.98 seconds. When it's flying up and then down, it takes 6.98 seconds. When it's flying from the beginning to the end, side to side, 6.98 seconds. So there is no direction on that. Now I have enough information where I can use my equations. So I'm going to scroll down here just a little bit so I got more space. I'm looking for dx. I can only use numbers that are x numbers. So my v1 here has to be the x v1, 94. Times my time. Now I know my time number, 6.98, plus 1 half times my a. My a is 0. My time, 6.98 squared. Beautiful thing, zero times one half or zero times 6.98 squared or zero times anything, what happens? It cancels out to zero. So I'm really, I can cross that whole, whole part off. DX just equals 94 times 6.98. So plug that into my calculator, 94 times 6.98, and I get 656.12 units on that are going to be meters. That's the range. That's how far the cannonball will fly for the pirates. If you have any questions, that was a lot. Not a problem. Please send those questions my way. Please show me what you've tried to do. I will try to get some responses out to those as well. Um, possibly some more videos, different situations to do that. Thanks.